This is what our new braking systems look like. No, they're not cool purple. We, we don't get ours that way. Pierce paints all of our stuff the way we want the same rib color. But they're trying to show you the differences in components. This is a modern disc brake. These are more advanced. One thing I do want you to understand though, this is your air can. It is an internal slack adjuster system. There is no slack adjuster for you to measure on the outside. It's all built in. I've also heard these called direct applied because there isn't a convoluted linkage system that takes the power the air brake applies and has to change direction and put it into the brake. It is directly applied to the inner pad. Questions on that? This is what our modern braking systems on our pumps and our trucks looks like. There's less to go wrong. They are much more dependable. They are faster responding. There's no measurements of any kind. They're pretty awesome braking systems. We also don't have problems with them cracking the rotors like we used to. All right, the rotor. This is the rotor. This is what our brakes are actually grabbing a hold of. This is what is stopping the vehicle. So you have a pinching or a scissoring action. That chrome portion right there, and what you see right here in the middle on this, the white band right through the middle, that is the rotor. That's what's actually turning and that the brakes are grabbing a hold of to stop your vehicle. This is what that linkage looks like. So this one here is the caliper. It is silver. This is actually the pair of scissors or the clamp, if you want to, that grabs a hold of that rotor and stops your vehicle. I'll explain why. Pads. Do we understand that there are a difference between pads and shoes? Shoes are inside of drum brakes. Pads are on disc brakes. All right. This is that same braking system that I just showed you that was super cool purple. Just a different picture of it. All right. Here is the concept all of these disc brakes work off of. This is your rotor that turns. With me? This caliper houses those two pads and controls whether or not it's pinching on this rotor or not. So, when I apply pressure, it energizes this portion of it and it causes the inner pad to push forward and start applying pressure to this rotor. Is everybody cool with that? Do you need to come up here and look at this? If you do, feel free. So this is where the power is applied. It applies pressure to that inner pad and it pushes forward. That rotor spins, but it doesn't give left to right. It stays right there in the center. So there's only so far it can push that inner pad before this is now gonna resist. It's now causing drag, we're starting to slow. As that pressure increases, this is not gonna allow it to actually continue going. So it's gonna start transferring the caliper back the whole thing is going to pull back this direction and cause the outer pad to grab. The movement is all on these two pins. You with me? That pressure kicks in, pushes forward, can't go any further than hitting this. It causes the whole thing to transfer back and applies the outer. This is nothing more than a more modern version of exactly the one that I just showed you. Drum brakes. There's my slack adjuster, my brake can. This extends out, causes this arm to travel, twists this, and that S cam right there will turn, and it causes those shoes to separate by just wedging them out, pushing them away from each other. It then causes drag on the inside of the drum. Questions? So parts for our, our uh, drum brakes. There is that, come on. There's the S cam, the shaft that it sits on, that's all right here. You got the drum that houses all of it, and you've got the shoes. The shoes are on the top and the bottom, and when we apply the brake, it does nothing more than just push them apart and cause them to drag on the inside of the drum. All right, so our inspection processes. You're gonna get this over and over and over again, and I've been long-winded. So, because you're gonna get this over and over and over again, I'm not gonna pound this home on you, but just understand that on your brake inspections, all of that is very deliberate. The order it's in is very, very deliberate. The idea behind it 
by doing the tests in the ways that you're being taught. It allows you to inspect all the different phases of that system and find out if there's any inadequacies. We showed you that first slide and that there were four different color systems and they're all integrated. Doing the brake inspections the way we tell you to do them will allow you to test all four of those systems in their current state and find out if they're going to serve you before you roll that rig. You with me on that? So, as we go through these at different phases of this class, you're going to find that we're going to repeat the same stuff over and over and over again. All of it is in your task book. It's also going to be in your free trip inspection book that you're going to get from Beth the next time you guys are here. All of it is spelled out and exactly what she wants done and why. Now, if you have a braking system that has a slack adjuster on it, we expect you to measure the state of that slack adjuster. What does that mean? Well, when I have the brakes released, this thing travels back into a relaxed state and it lets me measure from this can to the center of that pin known as a clevis pin. And if that is not the measurement it's supposed to be, it tells me that there is either an adjustment that needs to be made or the braking system is not relaxing the way it should be. If it's not relaxing the way it should be, it's going to cause the brakes to drag. We don't want that. So I will put air in the can, I'll push back the spring, I'll come over with a measuring stick that we have made, looks just like these, and I'm going to measure from this can to the center of that clevis pin and make sure that it's the measurement that it should be. You with me on that? Then I'm going to apply the brakes either by using the foot pedal or in this case the spring brake and I'm going to measure that again and that is the stroke that you should be looking for. So you're going to measure that clevis pin at rest and make sure that it's where it's supposed to be. If it's not where it's supposed to be, it's going to screw up all your measurements. If it's dramatically different than where it's supposed to be, it's going to cause your brakes to drag. You with me? Now I can give you a standardized measurement of 2 and 5 eighths inches is what your clevis pin should be. But I can also tell you that we've got a series of rigs that don't have that same measurement. So there's nothing that's guaranteed on this. If there's a question about what that measurement should be at rest, please look in your engineer's manual. Talk to the crews around you. If you're driving something like old truck one that is still in service, it has three different braking systems. Two of those braking systems still have slack adjusters, but they're different from each other. One is two and three eighths, one is two and five eighths. You use the wrong stick, all your measurements come out wrong. Talk to the crew. Don't expect you to know all of this stuff from the second you walk into a station, but I expect you to be able to ask the crews that are in there and find out what's different about yours. Now, when it comes to your measurements, the most important measurement on our modern vehicles is the pad thickness. All right, pads are on disc brakes. Shoes are on drum brakes. The reason I say that is because they have different tolerances. The distance we expect you to identify on a disc brake and its pads. We want you to be able to look at this is the rotor, the big white thing right in the center. Questions on that? We understand that? The notch in the center is for cooling. So from there to there is still the same machine. From right there to right there is the actual pad material. There's a steel plate that pad material is mounted to that goes from there to there. Can you see it? We, you were with me on that. This big silver thing right here is a spring that holds it all in together. That is pad material until it gets to right there. That is backing plate from there to there. The backing plates are commonly around a quarter of an inch. They're not all the same. Different manufacturers have different backing pad measurements. But I need a measurement. I need you to understand that when we're talking about a thickness, we're talking about from the edge of the rotor to the edge of the pad material, not the whole damn thing. So from right there to right there, and from right there to right there. Do you see what I'm pointing out? All right. If we say we want you to call the shop at a quarter of an inch and tell them that your brakes are at a quarter of an inch, I expect you to understand that 
it's a quarter of an inch from there to there. This is obviously not a quarter of an inch. If this portion on the backing plate right there, from there to there, is a quarter of an inch, what would you estimate this part to be? Half inch. If that were a half an inch, that's a quarter. So that would be a quarter and that would be a quarter. Is it greater than a quarter? All right. So that's a quarter. We go quarter, half, greater than three quarters of an inch. Or should I say less than three quarters of an inch, but greater than a half. You want to make another guess? Five eighths of an inch, maybe? It doesn't have to be any harder than that. The big thing to remember as you're going through this is that it's difficult to see while you're laying underneath the rig. But I need you to understand that that's what you're measuring uh -huh. and that you do have references that will give you some indication of what your measurements are. If that's a quarter, just use that as a reference point and compare it to the rest of this. If it's three of these that run across, that would be three quarters. If it's less than that, but it's greater than a half an inch, that would be five eighths. There are a lot of documentation out there that will tell you that you don't even have to look at the brakes so much, that there are notches on the different calipers in relationship to how everything mounts and all the rest of it. To me, because every manufacturer is different and because this information is going to be kind of hard to retain, I don't recommend that you use the different notches and the different indicators and pointers and all the rest of it. Just look at the pads. At a quarter of an inch, we want you to call the shop and tell them, I'm going to need a brakes job before too much longer. At an eighth of an inch is what the department says we want you to take your vehicle out of service. Law says when you get to a sixteenth of an inch, it is illegal for you to drive that vehicle. Our department says when you get to an eighth of an inch, we don't want you driving it. We do not want you driving it. Why? We're not truckers. We don't drive nice and gentle. We have a tendency to beat these things around and absolutely drive them like we stole them. So, Leaving that little cushion between an eighth of an inch and a sixteenth of an inch may be the difference of having your brakes fade and come apart on you. We don't want that. So, quarter of an inch, you call the shop. Eighth of an inch, you take your vehicle out of service. Law says sixteenth of an inch, you better not be on public roadways or you're illegal. So these are pointing out all the different indicators of where things sit on the brakes. I don't even want to get into all that. One brake system, the, the early version of the Meritors had a little dipstick that was on there with graduations on it. Again, look at the brakes. They never lie. It doesn't matter what braking system it is. If you look at your pads and the thicknesses in there, they'll never lie. Look at the rotors and look for cracks. If a crack is over an inch and an eighth in length, it is considered an out of service crack. If you notice that they're not even anymore and it's leaving big trails of brake material on there, that crack has gone through and through. If you see that the crack runs all the way out to the end and is now around the corner, that's a problem. So right here, I have two cracks. One is out of service, one is still in service. You see the way these cracks aren't as long? Those are this type of brake right over here and they were really common. It was just the way these things, they had a problem with it, absorbing heat, they just cracked. The harder you drove them, the faster they cracked. These cracks here and here are much longer than these other ones. Those are out of service cracks. These ones over here, it's not only the length, but the fact that it goes around the corner and it's now actually tucked up and around the outer edge. Any crack that goes around the edge is an out of service crack because you're gonna start having separation. The rotor is going to crack all the way through. All right, tires. Tires are a problem. We have a big issue with the way these new rigs all wear the, rig, wear the tires out. Do not overlook the obvious. Take the time to look at them, please. These people obviously weren't taking the time to realize that both of them smoking, they probably shouldn't have been standing right there. Which is more flammable, gasoline liquid or gasoline vapor? vapor. Yeah. Apparently that's not common knowledge. Please don't hurry. Yeah. Please don't yeah. hurry. Now we're done. If the tire's flat, take the time to find that out. It's not, it's not usually a mystery. But on your duels, if you have an inner tire that's flat and an outer tire that is not, or vice versa, it is possible for you to not notice that. 
I had that just a couple weeks ago. One of the other engineers came in and said, hey, dude, you notice how the rig felt different last night? No, because I drove 15 miles an hour, one block. I didn't notice anything at all. Why? He says, because the inner duel is totally flat. That's why you do a pre-trip every morning. I did one when it wasn't flat. Next morning it was. Good catch. All right. Stuff stuck in the treads. Not good. More stuff stuck in the treads. Bald. I got that rig on a turnover. Yeah, bro, everything's good. Fuel's good. Yeah, later. That's how my tires work. This is one of the common problems that we're having. Because of the geometry on the front end, because of the way they turn, because of the way the vehicle leans, we're having the outer edge of our front tires wear out very, very quickly. Because we're in North America, we have a tendency to take long sweeping left turns and very sharp right turns. We're sitting on the outside of the arc on a right hand turn. We feel the G's much more on a right hand turn because it's sharper and because we're on the outer edge of the turn. Left hand turns were on the inner edge of the circle of the arc and it's a more sweeping turn. We have a tendency to take left turns about twice the speed we take right turns. It's putting a ton of strain on the outer edge of the captain's side front tire. Now, when we look at whether your tires are serviceable or not, we usually talk about how deep are the treads. That's really no longer the case on the front tires. Absolutely applies on the rear tires. And if you find that your tires are actually thin on a front tire, it applies. The, this edge right here is usually what causes us to get new front tires. As you can see, there's a difference in these two rubbers. This rubber over here is the stuff you should be driving on. This stuff right here is the stuff the rubber you should be driving on is attached to. It's the softer under layer. This falls under the category of tire damage, and it's out of service criteria. But if you don't look at that outer edge of the tire, you're not going to notice it. One day, usually one day, is all it takes to go from, it was fine yesterday, and now it's not because you don't have any indicator of how much that has worn off. So I've had a lot of people tell me the wear indicators are still good. Those are decorative, those aren't wear indicators, they're reference points, they're just pretty, cool, notchy kind of stuff that the tire manufacturer puts on there. What you need to be paying attention to is the difference between that edge and the one on the driver's side. If they're dramatically different, you need to be aware of the fact that that captain's side has worn a lot more. If you see any of this type of wear on any of your tires, that's out of service criteria. You see the way this is a lot more slight than the previous slide was? It should have never been allowed to get that far. As soon as you saw that, that thing should have been taken out of service. That falls under out of service for tire damage. So when they ask you, well, what are your tread depth measurements? This is me looking at heavily worn tire, outer edge, and it still measures 10, 30 seconds. What is the out of service criteria for a front tire, a steering tire? What? 430 seconds. Obviously, I still got a long way to go. That's a transition we're currently making. The department is now catching on. The, sh the fleet services shop is now catching on, and everybody is getting into the same groove as far as whether or not this is out of service because it's kind of a new thing for us. But you've got to look. Now, while I'm doing brake inspections and I'm doing tire inspections and I'm rolling around on that creeper on the ground, I have a tendency to look at the rotor from the back side, from the brake caliper side, but I also swing around onto the outside of it and I look through the holes and I'm looking at the caliper on the outer edge. And I'm looking at the, uh, the uh, rotor, looking for cracks. While I'm there, pull back and put your focus on the actual aluminum wheel itself. Can you see the cracks? They're slight, but they're there. If you don't look, you won't find them. Just so happened, this particular wheel had some pretty dramatic cracks in it. 
And as I looked around after the shock got out there and took the wheels off, we were both curious how much it was cracked. And these cracks that went from the lug nut hole to lug nut hole to lug nut hole went the whole way around the inside of the wheel. The whole way around. One more hard turn and it may have been the last one we did before that wheel came apart. You don't know that it's cracked that bad until you take it off. All right, secondary braking devices. The law says that we have to have some type of secondary braking devices if the vehicle weighs more than 30,000 pounds. Not a test question, just a curio. I'd be able to work a fear out of it. Bet, I don't care, whatever. But all of our fire engines are expected to have secondary braking devices. Our brush rigs are actually kind of under this, but the smart money is on having a secondary braking device. Now, the different types we have. We have engine brakes that we call a jake brake. We have telmas, which are basically big electromagnets that are attached to the drive line. They can either be in the middle of the drive line or actually back at the rear differential. But they are a big magnet helping slow you down. We have transmission retarders, which essentially use the same kind of concept but built into the transmission itself. And then we have exhaust brakes. In the automotive world, the old rule is if you can't put it in if you can't get it out. So they're using choking down your exhaust as a way to slow the vehicle down because it won't allow the vehicle to accelerate. All right, we're going to get through this. Here's what your different switches look like for a jake brake. It just says engine brake, engine brake on and off, engine brake level. So this allows the engine brake to turn on and off. This determines how many of the cylinders in your jake brake system are disabled. Diesel engines work on compression, meaning very, very high air pressure inside the cylinders is what causes your fuel to explode and provide power. Gasoline engines don't work at anywhere near that. That's why they have to have spark plugs to ignite the fuel. Diesels don't. Just injecting the fuel at the last second, just the extreme pressure it's under, it causes that fuel to ignite. If I can open up a cylinder and vent off some of that pressure, it causes those cylinders to stop providing power and causes the engine to slow. That's what a jake brick does. It opens the valves, allows the pressure to escape so that it will not ignite the fuel. How many of those cylinders it opens up is what the low, medium, and high is all about. Low, it opens two cylinders on a six-cylinder engine. Medium, it opens four. High, it opens all six. All right, secondary braking devices continue. We got all the different stuff. Now, secondary braking devices, one thing I want to drive home here. If the ABS system does not control whether or not it will skid, you need to disable it in inclement weather. The jake brake is not controlled by your ABS, your analog brake system. The Telma is. So, what we tell people, what department standard is, in inclement weather, turn off the jake brake. Why? Because the ABS cannot disable it if you start into a skid. It will help make you skid. So turn that off. Your Telma and the traction control are controlled by the ABS. So. Leave those on in inclement weather because they will help you stop. If the Telma is causing it to skid, the ABS will turn it off, control the skid, and then re-enable it. Make sense? So that's what this means. It does not mean turn the Telma off. It means turn the Jake off in inclement weather. We clear on that? Jake off, Telma on. All right, your Telma. This is what it looks like from underneath. This is the differential. Telma is connected to the front of it. That's a side view of your Telma. Here are the electromagnets. When you turn it on quarter, half, three quarter, and full, it's how many of those magnets are you energizing. If it's midship, it's mounted in here, ahead of the differential. And if it's focal, it's back there in the very back. Ours are all focal. All right. More and more and more and more and more and more. This is all just different ways you turn them on, how they're controlled on the Telma. Like I said, each light is two of those magnets. You put it into the second notch, it's now considered half. You're, not, you're actually activating six of the 12 magnets. When you turn it on to the third notch, eight of the 12 magnets. Get me? 
That's what the joystick looks like. That's what the exhaust brake looks like. It's a valve that chokes down your exhaust and makes it so the engine can't build power because it can't put in what it can't get out. So it's got a variable valve. The more you push on the throttle or the, the lever for that exhaust brake, the more it closes that valve and chokes out the engine. There's our inclement weather. We already went over that. And like I said, folks, all of these slides are all accessible to you off of Target Solutions. You can refer back to any of this at any time if you want to reference. So, North American Out of Service Criteria, what is that? That is the law, according to Department of Transportation, as to what can be driven, what cannot be driven, and what criteria is to be taken off the road. All right? So, this is where you find it. Target Solutions, Quick Links, Training, Driver Training. Out of service criteria, and we update this every time it's updated, which is either every year or every other year, depending on how much change there's been. They will update it, we update it. All right, defective brakes according to the North American out of service criteria. Pretty common in most cases. If something's broken and you can see that it's broken, that's out of service criteria. Now, here's one of those weird things. How many of your brakes can be disabled, out of service, and you still be on the road? How many brakes can you have broken and you still drive the rig? Like brakes, like disc brakes or? Like busted, brakes? like busted brakes, foundation brakes. 20%, believe it or not, you are allowed up to 20% of your braking systems to be broken and stay on the road. Why does that not work out for us? Because we only have four brakes. And if one of those brakes is busted, that's 25% immediately. Got me? So if we have a tractor trailer, or if we have a service aerial, and it's got an additional axle, is it possible for me to have one brake be 20%? Yeah. Yeah. We just don't. Law says if you've got a busted brake, and it's less than 20% of your overall braking system, that you can continue driving. The goal is not for you to just forget about it and keep going. It's Finish what you're doing, get it off the road, get it fixed. For us, you got a busted brake, you aren't going anywhere. Ours is, you're out of service. But, as you read through the North American out of service criteria, it will tell you 20% or less. So, there's a ton of stuff here, and it is regularly updated, and I strongly recommend that you actually read the North American out of service criteria, because that is the toolbox you have to know whether or not you should be driving that rig or not. Or if the shop asks you to drive the vehicle there and it's busted and you know it's out of service according to this criteria, you're not even allowed to drive it to the shop. You're not. You need to know what that North American out of service criteria says. All right, here's one for you. Low pressure warning devices. Each one of those gauges that we were talking about, it has two types of alarms. It has an audio and a visual. So if there is an alarm and one of those things does not work as long as the other does. So in other words, if the alarm goes off but the light does not go on, you're still serviceable. If the light goes on but the alarm does not go off, you are still serviceable. But it must have at least one of those for each gauge. Make sense? Here's your coals, the stuff we were talking about before. Cut in, cut out, applied, low pressure, and spring brake. That's coals. The plus four is going to be your parking brake, your service brake, your anti-lock, and your pressure build-up. That is the order. It is not a mystery. It's in the slides, it's in your task book, and it's in the book that you're going to get from Beth next day. Beth is the fleet person that's going to be doing your testing. That's the order she wants it in. We're not hiding it. We're sticking this in your face every chance we get. All right. One of the things they're going to ask you for during your pre-trip and part of that Coles is ABS test. If you look on your dash, you're going to see that ABS light. That ABS light is an indication of whether or not the computer circuitry and all of the pre-checks for that system are functional. How do you check the ABS for your coals? You turn the ignition on. All your lights on your dash come on. That one right there for ABS comes up. If it goes off, 
it has checked out and you're good to go. If that light stays on and irregularity has been detected and that system is not gonna function, that's a fail. So while you're doing your pre-trip, for us and with Beth, for Coles plus four, one of them is ABS. Ignition on, light. Identify the light. If the light goes off, cancel it from there. You're good. If your system, if your vehicle has ABS and you have to make a panic stop, we expect you to stomp on the brake, stay on the brake, and steer around. A thousand years ago when I started driving these big rigs, there wasn't any of that stuff and I had to use my foot and how hard I applied the brake to keep me out of a skid. Nowadays, with the modern braking systems, they all have ABS. We want you to stomp, stay, and steer. If you let your foot off, the system resets. You will now start to skid again, and then you have to reapply and get it to engage. It's better, and your stopping will be shorter if you get on the brakes, stay on the brakes, and steer around the problem. Don't let up. Questions about that? Very good.